Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Let me take this opportunity to thank you for being here for uh, another event in our week of inauguration activities, the Academic Symposium. Uh, on behalf of the Division of Academic Affairs, faculty, students, staff, and the entire university, I want to thank you. Thank you for joining us. I want to thank the panel for being here to share your expertise. And so we are going to go ahead and get started so we can spend all of our time discussing this most important topic that will be covered today, creating opportunities that advance justice in Baltimore and Maryland. It is an honor for me to introduce to you our president, Dr. Anthony L. Jenkins, who became the eighth president of Coppin State on May 26. We know that he is a respected higher education leader and he's an advocate that creates opportunities for students, especially those who are from underrepresented in, uh, communities. We know that he's a champion of public policy issues and we know that he support institutions of higher ed that focus on, his support focuses on enrollment and retention, diversity, leadership, African American male initiatives, social justice, first generation college students, funding higher ed, and the list continues all with the intent to support student success. We know that a major factor in student success is faculty excellence, support, research, and advancement. President Jenkins has launched activities that support interdisciplinary work of faculty to advance faculty excellence and academic program growth, which will invariably result in student success. Since his tenure 17 months ago at Coppin State, Dr. Jenkins has made collaboration and conversations with on-campus and off-campus communities a priority. And this symposium is one of those opportunities for continued dialogue. We've heard his story before. Those of you who have not, he was born in D.C., Washington, D.C. He was raised between D.C. and North Carolina. He is a United States Army veteran, and he began his path to the presidency as a first-generation college graduate of Fayetteville State University. First generation, now our president. He earned his master's degree from North Carolina Central and a doctorate from Virginia Tech. He's married to his college sweetheart, Toinette, and they have two beautiful daughters, Ashley and Alicia. Let's welcome our president, Dr. Anthony Jenkins, who is serving as a moderator of this symposium. Dr. Jenkins. Thank you, Provost. How's everyone doing this evening? Good. 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 As I take a moment to uh, get set up, and we're going to have a great discussion with our wonderful panel, um, the provost had the opportunity to indicate that I was a proud veteran of the United States Army. But let me uh, recognize another one. Uh, my brother-in-law is here. Stand up. This is retired Command Sergeant Major Bernard Smalls. Thank you very much. 30 plus years of service to our country. Um, and he did it at the highest level and did a remarkable job. Today, we have the opportunity to come together and talk, or better yet, continue a conversation that we started last June when I first arrived. And we brought together some of our sharpest minds on campus and beyond to initiate this conversation. And so today, it is a pleasure to bring uh, even more uh, sharp minds to this discussion as we expand it uh, to focus on some very important and real issues. So the academic symposium today, as I said, is to build off our virtual discussion that we had last year, uh, which was entitled Minds on Justice. And this year, I want us to go a little deeper and talk a little more about some of the solutions 
and the challenges, the opportunities, and how we are going to lead from a position of the front. But uh, this also presents an opportunity for us to look at the challenges within our community. And there are challenges. But I am confident that the challenges that are within our community are challenges that we can solve. We have the capabilities and the intellect to do so. We're also going to, uh, around our discussion, talk about uh, how this trauma impacts our community, the harm that it brings to the community and the level of violence that we've been seeing across our community. And we're going to have that conversation from a intergenerational perspective, which I think is going to add another level of value and depth. We also want to take time to recognize the recent efforts to curtail violence here in Baltimore City and the plans uh, that we have adopted and will continue to adopt from our mayor and other city leaders, as well as our experts here at Coppin on developing solutions. And we wanna create a space where current students, and we have one of our student leaders on the panel with us today, uh, and distinguished alumni and faculty can share their ideas and their educational perspectives on how to tackle these complex issues. And we want to discuss uh, and to consider how systemic racism, economic inequality, and disinvestment in communities has impacted the residents of Baltimore, and specifically the West Side. And so it is a pleasure for me to introduce to you our panel today and those very topics and areas that we're going to be focusing on. So first, I would like to introduce, now Kelly, you told me how to do this, but you all know a president can't do anything without his team. So school me again, because I was pressing this one. So you should have put president, press this one right here. All right, there you go. That's how it works. All right, so let me introduce Dr. Johnny Rice II. Uh, Dr. Rice, that's not Dr. Rice. <laughs> that's Dr. Rice. Much better looking, look at that. Right, Dr. Rice serves as department chair and associate professor in criminal justice here at Coppin State University. He is a research fellow in the Bishop L. Robinson uh, Senior Justice Institute that we have here on campus, which is a leading institute not only in our city but in our state. Dr. Rice has spent the past 22 years providing leadership, technical assistance, and support uh, for organizations to serve low-income fathers and families in the areas of child welfare, um, youth development, and criminal justice, all with the efforts of creating safe and stable communities. Uh, Dr. Rice has earned uh, his bachelor's degree and master's degree in criminal justice from University of Baltimore and he received his doctorate of uh, public health uh, from Morgan State University. And so we are honored to have him with us. And finally, Dr. Rice is a proud member of Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity Incorporated Baltimore Alumni Chapter, the benchmark. And uh, he resides here in Maryland and is, the proud, is a proud husband and father. So please, let's welcome Dr. Rice. Deputy Commissioner Cherie Briscoe is a 27-year veteran of the Baltimore Police Department. She currently oversees the Operations Bureau, which includes the Patrol uh, Division, Criminal Justice, I'm sorry, Criminal Investigation Division, and the Data-Driven Strategies Division. Uh, Deputy Commissioner Briscoe is an FBI are you going to, oh, I didn't even bring her picture. I'm sorry. See, there you go. At least I got it. Thank you. All right. See, that's how you take charge. <laughs> right there. That is leadership. Every day. That's how we do. Thank you. Because I was so focused on not messing up you all's bios. Right? I forgot to press the button. All right. So, we're, so I was uh, 
Deputy Commissioner Briscoe is an FBI National Academy graduate in Section 276 and a graduate of Coppin State University. That's right. Where she earned her bachelor's degree in criminal justice. And Deputy Briscoe is a mother of four and a grandmother of five beautiful granddaughters. Five beautiful granddaughters. And she and her husband are proud residents of Baltimore City. Please, let's welcome Deputy Commissioner Briscoe. <laughs> Mr. D. Watkins is editor at large for Salon. His work has been published in the New York Times, New York Times Magazine, The Guardian, Rolling Stones, and other notable publications. Mr. Watkins is uh, the author of uh, the New York bestsellers, the, uh, the B-Side, Living and Dying While Black in America, The Cookbook, A Crack Rock Memoir, and We Speak for Ourselves, A World from Forgotten Black America. Mr. Watkins holds a master's in education from Johns Hopkins University and a master's in fine art and creative writing uh, from uh, the University of Baltimore. Currently, he is a college lecturer at the University of Baltimore and um, in the areas of arts and social justice. And uh, we want to welcome Mr. Watson, who was born and raised right here in Baltimore City, where he currently resides. Please welcome Mr. Watson. <laughs> Dr. Caselyn Braze Stinson serves as a full professor of social work and the executive director of the Dr. Dorothy Hikes Center for the Advancement of Social Justice at Coppin State University. Dr. Bray Stinson earned her PhD in social work from Howard University, a master's of social work degree from the Ohio State University, and a master's of divinity degree from, I mean, and graduate certificate in women's studies also from Howard University. She has dedicated more than 25 years at uh, various uh, private and public institutions, and she is the first African-American woman to serve as president of the Board of Directors for the North American Association of Christians in Social Work. Please help me welcome Dr. Braves Dennison. <laughs> Mr. Jaheed Chapman is a junior majoring in interdisciplinary studies uh, with his first concentration in art and a second concentration in military science. He is, uh, he is currently serving as the 21st Mr. Coppin State University. A senior, that's right, clap him up. A senior resident assistant uh, in the Office of Residence Life, a campus ambassador for the Office of Admissions, and he is also enrolled in Coppin State University's ROTC program. Uh, Mr. Chapman grew up in Baltimore City, attended Baltimore City Public Schools, and reflecting back on his adolescent years, uh, Mr. Chapman wants to change the narrative of the black male in Baltimore City. Please help me welcome Mr. Chapman. <laughs> Professor Susan Fetcho. Uh, serves as the coordinator of uh, clinical training in the Department of Psychology, Counseling, and Behavioral Health in the College of Behavioral and Social Sciences here at Coppin State University. Professor Fetcho is a licensed clinic uh, professional counselor, a state board approved uh, clinical supervisor, a nationally certified approved clinical supervisor, and a board certified uh, tele, tele mental health provider. Did I get that right, Doc? Yeah. All that, but that, that's outstanding. All right. She earned her master's degree uh, in postal uh, counseling and is currently a doctoral candidate in counseling education and supervision. Please help me welcome Professor Fetcho. <laughs> and with that, ladies and gentlemen, I have identified our outstanding panel 
of experts who will engage us in our conversation over the next uh, few minutes together. So, to our panel, let me start with uh, just a couple of thoughts here. I'm going to ask um, each of our panel members to give us about a three to five minute uh, reflection from your lens of shaping the positive changes uh, that need to occur here in Baltimore City. I want you to give us about three minutes on that. Mm -hmm. And uh, Dr. Rice, I'm going to start with you, and we'll move our way down the panel, and then we'll break it up as additional questions are asked so everyone has uh, ample time to respond. Dr. Rice. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm really excited to be here to have the opportunity to uh, share. I want to acknowledge, of course, uh, my Dean O'Brien, the College of Behavioral Social Sciences, my colleagues, uh, Team CJ, as well as other faculty and staff and administrators who are here, but most importantly, my students and students of Coppin State University that are here to listen to our message uh, and to ask some thought-provoking and inspiring questions. What I hope to bring to this discussion today is really a lens of criminal justice and public health. Uh, my background, born and raised in Baltimore City, and I grew up in a home in which there was domestic violence. My father was a violent man towards my mother. He was an alcoholic, uh, and he had a lot of different issues. Uh, he worked, uh, he was functioning, but he was not uh, an engaged father. He was not a loving father. And that experience as a young child really started to shape my lens and it developed a lot of anger and hatred uh, towards him uh, and just in general. And so that experience was one in which uh, I would reflect on as I became a professional, as I was pursuing my degrees, getting my first jobs, and I recognized that some of the same challenges that I witnessed within my household I was seeing that in the work that I was doing. So what do I mean? So for instance, one of the first jobs that I had was a foster care worker for Baltimore City Department of Social Services. As a foster care worker, I had the tough job of reunification of families. I worked with siblings, trying to keep them together, uh, couples who had history of domestic violence, substance abuse, and in working with those families and working with those children and during those home visits, I saw some very dark things. I saw depression, I saw despair. But I also saw children that smiled. I also saw parents that were trying to do the things that they needed to do uh, in order to reconnect with their children. And I learned a lot uh, through that uh, experience. And it would be helpful when I would transition and then work at a place called Focus Point. It was a secured residential treatment center with at-risk youth. These young people were suicidal, homicidal, AWOL risk. These were young people who were referred from Department of Juvenile Services, referred from DSS. And when I reviewed their case files, I saw kids that witnessed their mother get murdered in front of them. I saw young people that were thrown out of school because they may have had a firearm or they may have acted uh, oppositional defiant towards teachers. But I also saw young people who became like sons and daughters to us. We were like surrogate parents to them, giving them love, giving them support that their parents did not give them or weren't able to give them at a certain time. I saw young people coming in wild had to be restrained by crisis unit, then saw those young people being leaders on the milieu, being able to go on home visits, and then socially adjusting back into their communities. I would later have the opportunity to work in the prison, Patuxent. At Patuxent, I would come into the class as an addictions counselor, happy to teach, and I would see guys from the neighborhood. They would say, what are you doing here? And then I would look at them and say, what are you doing here? And so we would, sit down and have these discussions about their dreams and their goals and what they wanted to achieve once they left out of the prison. 
and we would help them to deal with substance abuse issues, deal with all the different types of barriers that they had. It was eye-opening to see young black men who didn't give up, who wanted to do better, and who wanted to break a transgenerational curse, because many of them felt like, man, this is what my father did, and look at me now, right? And so I would try to give them some inspiration and hope. And one of the last practice-based experiences I had was as an administrator at the Center for Urban Families, not far from here. We would work with low-income fathers and families, fathers who needed employment but had criminal justice backgrounds, mental health issues, lack of high school diploma. We didn't care how they presented we felt as though we could make a difference and get them to change. And the basis was, if we get them to change, they'll be able to invest in their children, and their children will have a better outlook and a better future. And we hit the community. We didn't wait for them to come into our doors. We went out into the community all across Baltimore to connect and make a difference. And so from foster care children, at-risk youth at focus point, to young men in the prison system, to fathers in our community, I saw pain, but I also saw transformation. So the same way my father was able to get resources and support, and his faith led him to transition from a violent man to a nonviolent man, I saw that transformational change in each of those groups that I mentioned along that life cycle. And so what I hope to bring to this discussion is us respecting our community, respecting our residents, but also understanding that change is a process. And we need to create pathways for change for those individuals who will take it and who need it. And so I'm really excited to be here, and I hope I can contribute to this dialogue. Thank you. Thank you, Doc. Of course, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. You would leave me to follow Dr. Rice. <laughs> okay, I'll try. Um, so thank you so much, Dr. Jenkins, for the invitation, Dr. Rice, for the invitation. It is truly my honor and my privilege to sit um, in this panel today and have a discussion. Oftentimes, law enforcement is invi invited to a room for a discussion, and there is a, 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 a lack of excitement to join the conversation. Um, and I don't approach that conversation from that lens today. I'm excited to be here. 27 years in the Baltimore Police Department. I am a native of Baltimore. I'm a product of the city. Um, I love my city. That's why I still serve and I still live in my city. Um, our communities are struggling. So I'll stick to the, to the, to the reflection and the setting the stage. It's reflecting back and looking forward. When I joined 27 years ago, the catalyst for me was my own crisis. So I'm, uh, as, you, as you, my bio read, five granddaughters, and people look at me like, oh, you, you can't possibly. Yes, it is so, because I was a teenage mother and an emancipated minor. I had to navigate a structure and a system of policy rules and laws that did not serve me or the people that I knew that looked like me well at all. Um, so when I was in my first stint of college, because I'm a recent graduate of Coppin State University, but my first stint of college was at Morgan, and the uh, recruiters for Baltimore Police Department ran me down the hall, and I know their names, Tyrone Kilby and Rebecca Harrington. I hold them dear in my heart because they saw something in me I didn't know was in myself. And that was the opportunity to join a team because much of what they were looking for, I thought I aligned with. Being able to serve communities, I was a part of the community, I'm like, okay, that check and do something of service and help and serve an ideology bigger than myself, give back to people that look like me that were, may have been struggling and struggling with the difficulties that I found myself in as a teenage mother and an emancipated minor. So that caused me to join the team. There's always something about yourself when you're joining, whether it's a higher education, whether it's uh, a sports team, whether in this case the profession of policing, there's always something about you that you're looking to align, and it did. Oddly enough, as you could imagine, a brown girl wearing blue, it aligned. The tenements of why I joined still align for me today. It was an opportunity to show up and help my own community and my own, my own people. So navigating the druthers of life at a young age and all that life's trauma, as you could imagine, can bring you, growing up in a domestically abusive home, um, ultimately getting pregnant and getting kicked out 
getting kicked out of my parents' house saved my life because it did not allow me to raise my children in a cycle that I had grown accustomed and normalized. Violence and mistreatment and abuse and addiction. Those are all taglines that when you see people are often not seen because we want to see the best of people or people are often not seen to us. They become invisible. So I wanted to do something in service that did not allow me to um, fall prey to statistic and that narrative and that line and policing became that pathway. But what I can say to you is through law and policy over the years, we in terms of service through policing have not always served well because the structure, the law, the policy does not serve and has not served and was not thought for for all people. Because as you very well know, though, when the laws were created, they were not created with all people in mind, though it reads as such. Um, so bearing that in mind, I've been very successful in the, in the word success in my policing craft, but it has not come without its own druthers and, and barriers and things to overcome. To be the highest ranking um, African American woman and the only one to ever achieve this seat does not come without its dismay. And I don't, I thank you for that warm affection, but I don't say it for the applause. I say it that that's a sad, sad state of affairs that I'm still saying in 2021, in the eighth largest, third oldest, that, that I'm a first, which tells you the, the type of barriers and challenge. And this is not a gift in, in terms of given to me. This is earned, earned well, earned hard, earned long, and earned on the shoulders of so many that have come before me. And that's my reflective look back. The look forward is there's a great possibility. Three weeks after the riots of 2015, and they, they were not, that was not civil unrest. That was a riot. I don't mean to sound offensive for whatever the ideology. I'm saying that there was utter chaos, discord, fracture, break. That was absolute heart-wrenching and heartbreaking to observe. But to to take the mantle of leadership in the Western District three weeks after those events and hold that seat as the major and commander of the Western District for three years, I did that with great pride and honor because I had the opportunity to come behind the veil of not just policing but community and say, help me, help us, help our do it better, understand what we have not done well or right, help create dialogue, ultimately policy and law change that will help us do that better and do it well and do it right with everyone in mind. So now at the seat of, as Deputy Commissioner of Operations, I have a greater seat of influence over policy, over change, and how we do that right, that we become more inclusive and that we do things with everyone in mind, all of community no matter their socioeconomic status, no matter their status of life, no matter any of the classified statuses, that we're more inclusive and diverse, and we show and lead with more of an empathetic understanding hand that welcomes all of ourselves and community. So excited to be with you today for that conversation. Thank you, thank you. Hello, um, I wanna start off and say thank you for inviting me um, to reflect. I wanna reflect back on my childhood. Um, I grew up on North Avenue and Longwood Street, two minutes away from here. Um, and I look back and say, who was my role model? And one thing I, I've noticed I've always learned what not to do by showing me. Um, some of my family members, alcoholics, drug addicts, woman abusers, um, also some of my friends. And to look back and look at myself today, why, why were they that? And that's because they didn't have no one to look up to. They didn't have 
they didn't have a superhero to look to. Um, and I want to be that person. I walk up and down the street and see the people that I grew up with. Some might not be alive, some might be in jail, and some might be on the corner. Um, and unfortunately, in Baltimore, that's the narrative for a black male. Um, I grew up in a single dad home. Um, I was fortunate enough to have a wonderful dad. Um, but some people weren't granted with that. They, 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 they didn't have the opportunity to have that. And the saying, it takes a village to raise a child. The way my, my village raised me, it's interesting. They did all the bad things around me. And I could have went one way, but I decided to go another way. And my life is like tug of war. I have the bad pulling, and then I have the good pulling. And sometimes it's just I don't know which way to go because the majority is over here, and then I feel lonely over here. Um, what I would like to bring to this conversation is what, as a young, a young student or students, um, what can we do and bring my ideas to the table to show that it's possible. Um, growing up, I didn't know what a, nothing about college. Growing up in Baltimore City, it's a lot of it's a lot of young young people. What's what's this? What's that? So when they see me, when they see me on social media doing this and doing that, they they look at it like, oh my gosh, you're a star. Me, I just look at it like anybody can do it. Um, I enlisted in the military at 17. Um, it was legit to come pay for school. And I'm not going to say I figured it out by myself, but I had to separate myself. And a lot of people can't separate themselves. So as students, it's ways we can put our boots on the ground in the city and help the community. Um, so that's, that, I just want to bring the, the student point of view and the student leader and me to this conversation. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So to answer the question, I would say two things. The first is exposure, right? How can we change anything if we don't even know what, what we are supposed to be growing into? The second part is a little more simple, but it's something that we all can think about as a collective. And that's that idea to be able to have a stake in society. And I say this because I don't only do this work. <laughs> I think about this a lot while I'm also doing the work. And I live inside of my head a lot. So sometimes I just drift off. And often I fall back into my childhood where I've seen some of the most horrible things that a person could see, things that I don't even want to talk about because I don't want the audience to get up and like, get depressed and start crying and trying to give me hugs and all that. I'm not a touchy guy. But I've seen some horrible things. And uh, when I hear my daughter running across the living room or I see my wife, who's copping proud and sitting in here, when I see her giggling at something, my mother-in-law said, who's also cop and proud, <laughs> and here. Yeah. Look at that. I bet I'm cop and proud, too. I told her for like almost three years. It was just no position for me, but I'm cop and proud, too. I got like, I got like three hoodies. <laughs> but, but when I see them, when I see them laugh, or when I see them smile, and I look up, and I'm like, wow, I'm, I'm here. Um, how did I become a New York Times best-selling author? How did I become a television executive creating my own show? How am I writing for HBO? Like, up straight from the darkest part of East Baltimore. How did, how did I get here? Because when I was growing up, there were no writers in my neighborhood. There were no television executives walking up and down Ashland Avenue. 
these people weren't around. I'm not saying it's their responsibility, but you know, we talking first generation college, I'm talking first generation high school and middle school. These things did not exist. Um, they were not in my orbit. So what did I dream? What did, what did I dream about or what did I want to do? What did my friends and I want to do? We wanted to mirror and imitate the people who were right in front of us. And then we grow into these worlds where people judge us for the decisions we make. And a lot of times those people, we never had proximity to you. So we didn't know what we could do. We didn't know you were doing these cool things. And if, if, we're, gonna, if we're gonna change these things, um, we really, really, really have to be the people that we needed. And that, the time to do that is now. Um, like I said, I don't, I don't only think about this a lot. I, I do this work and we can get into like some of the deeper aspects of it as, as we have these, these, these conversations, but um, we have to be the people that we needed. Uh, the, the, great, the great Baltimore guy, Frederick Douglass, said it's, it's easier to build strong children than it is to repair broken men and women. That's a real thing. We jump on too late sometimes when, you know, and it's never too late, but we can get ahead of some of these issues if we start exposing our young people to the things that, that they need. Um, showing them, working with them, and helping them believe that you can have a stake in society too. This city is yours, this country is yours, all of these things are yours. You can be what you wanna be, and then we have to be the people to give you the resources and things needed to make those dreams come true. Um, I've, 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 over the last six years, of, 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 I'm writing book number six right now, and I've met all kinds of people. I've spoken all types of neighborhoods, jails, community centers, Ivy League colleges. I've been all over the world. And what I will say is the only difference between poor people and rich people is connections. It's not talent. It's not ideas. It's not innovation. It's connections. You can have all of the talent in the world, but if you don't have a person showing you how to monetize or how to create something or how to get from step A to step B to step C, if you don't have that person constantly advocating for you in that room when you're not around, then you're always gonna lose to the guy who has the mom or dad who could just make a phone call and push a button. And that is why our city is the way it is. It doesn't mean we can't fix it. Um, my success story or the success story of any of these people on this stage doesn't mean that it's automatically going to transfer to the next person unless we do the work to make sure it transfers, it's not going to happen. So, you know, I'm thankful to be here, um, to be on this amazing panel and the amazing things that everyone before me has said and the amazing things that you guys are about to say and, and thank you for having me. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. So everybody has a story, right? My story is very different from everybody else's on the panel. My reality is that I'm a small town country girl from Virginia, and I ain't talking about Northern Virginia. I'm talking about Sticks, Virginia, country. And I come from a family that believed in education. That's my reality. My grandfather was a black principal of a black high school in Halifax County, Virginia, right? That's my legacy. I'm very thankful for that legacy. My mother was a servant through education. So what I know is service comes and is a requirement associated with your education. But I learned it not just as my colleagues have said from what I've seen, I learned it and then put it into action. And I learned it very early. I was just thinking about how I learned that education and advocacy were together. And I remember in high school, so we had problems in the country too, y'all. We had problems. One of the problems that I encountered, and it sounds, it may sound um, minor, but it's, it's my story and my beginning. I was an athlete, believe it or not, back in the day. And females were treated very differently from males. The men had a wonderful stadium. It looked like a stadium to me in my country, a little southern way. They had the, the field that was beautifully mowed and the lines and dugouts. And we had benches in the hot sun with bumpy outfields. And I remember 
My mother and my father have always said, you need to use your voice to advocate for people. And I went to the AD and I said, there's a problem here. My field looks nothing like their field and we are the state champions. That's a problem for me. I learned that act, my voice was used for activism. That's a part of my story. My parents always told me that to whom much is given, much is required. And I come from a lineage of where education was embraced, but the expectation to do something with, with the education was embraced. In college, I remember telling somebody, there, there are two fellow Oakwood graduates in the room, and I remember when I was a junior in college, uh, Mr. M Mr. Coppin, I said to a male um, fellow student, I said, I think I'm gonna run for a student government office. And he said, what, secretary? I said, excuse me, you know, I'm gonna run for president. And I did, and I won. And I used my voice in an educational setting to make a difference for other folk because I knew that education and advocacy were connected. Are you with me? Even now, at Coppin, I still believe that education and advocacy are connected, and everything that I do promotes education and advocacy. It is who I am. The question was, how can we impact Baltimore? If you are in this room, that means that you have a level of education. It also means that you have the responsibility to use your education to advocate for somebody else. Whether it's in Annapolis, on Capitol Hill, in your classroom, whether you're speaking up for a colleague. What, so let me, let me, let me talk one, say one more thing about the connection between education and advocacy. I really got it when I was on faculty at another university. And I'm a person of faith. I'm very engaged in my faith community. Two sisters in my faith community were killed in one domestic violence incident. They had a double funeral. One of the saddest funerals that I have ever attended to, attended, leaving an infant, a toddler, It was at that point that I knew that I needed to use my education and my voice to advocate for people who have been impacted by domestic violence. And just listening to the, we don't know one another, but listening to the stories today, you can hear how domestic violence has impacted almost everybody, if not everybody on this panel. If you have an opportunity to be educated, I want to challenge you to use your education to advocate for others. Your thing may not be domestic violence. It may not be advocating for women. But advocate for somebody. Changes will only come in Baltimore once we speak up, use our voices to facilitate change. And that's what advocacy is. And that's my story. I'm sticking with it. <laughs> Thank you, Doc. <laughs> I feel honored and humbled to be in this company. And um, you know, whatever I thought about saying before, I have gradually, as I've heard other stories, thought the connections and, and, and what I'd like to share with you about my journey and how I came to be where I am and, and where I would like to see us all go. Um, like others on the panel, I. Um, I'm a first generation college student like some others. I grew up in Delaware till I was 14 years old. My parents were from North Carolina. And um, my father was a, like a stereotypical Southern racist person. And my mother, who's probably the kindest person I've ever met, was the total opposite of that. So I, I grew up hearing you know, from that kind of dichotomy. I also, I went to elementary school, and I promise I won't take you through my whole 61 years, but I went to elementary school um, in the mid-60s, and there was a lot happening in the mid-60s. I went to an integrated school in rural Delaware, and the high school and the elementary school were on the same campus. The, the middle school was across town, but the high school was there with black kids and white kids. 
and when all the, um, the civil rights movement was going on, the black high school students and white high school students were fighting each other. Um, I remember seeing high school students come to school with chains and, you know, just sticks and scary things. Now, in elementary school, we were, getting, we were all getting along fine, and we didn't really understand what the big kids were fighting about. But it started to trickle down, too, and, and there were fights between little black kids and little white kids. Um, and I must, I could, could only have been about six years old, and I remember my mother taking me aside and saying to me, when you, it was during a time when there was a, a lot of fighting going on, and she said to me, there will be little colored girls, that was the, the term at the time, there will be little colored girls in your class that people are mean to. I don't want you to treat those colored girls the way you treat white girls. I want you to treat them better because there will be someone who's mean to them and it's up to you to make up for that. And I didn't quite grasp that at six, but, but I've grasped it since then. And I remember this came to mind so clearly a few years ago with the, um, I don't even know what to call it. They called it a Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville. Um, it, it was a, a travesty and a, a tragedy. Um, but my mother's words came to mind and all I could think of is these people who are there spouting the hatred they're spouting, what on earth are they teaching their children? And it's up to all the rest of us to make up for that. You know, we're gonna encounter the people, the people that those people are raising and we have to figure out how to counteract that somehow. So my whole journey has, has been about that. Um, I grew up with domestic violence as well, and um, you know, thank, thank God I'm happily married, have been for 37 years. Um, but early in my marriage, I started volunteering at a domestic violence center. And through that, I started hearing about a discipline called pastoral counseling, which combined psychological counseling and spirituality. And, um, I thought that that works for me because I'm a, a person of faith as well. So, um, you know, all along the way, when I look at my journey, I see how I came here to Coppin, and I'm so thankful for that. Um, volunteering in domestic violence, I met people who were professional counselors, and that led me to change. At the time, I was in um, public relations, but that led me to pursue a career as a professional counselor. And that led me to become a clinical supervisor. And at one of those jobs, I met someone who became the chair of my department um, here at Coppin. We've been friends for about 30 years now. But she asked me to come and work with the internship program here at Coppin. So again, looking back, if you had told me you'll someday be working at an HBCU, I wouldn't have known what an HBCU was, for one thing, but, but I, I would have thought, you, you really think so? I don't think so. Uh, I grew up across the street from a dairy farm, across the road. It wasn't a street. Um, so yeah, to be here on North Avenue at Coppin is something I could not have predicted, but when I look back, I see the doors that have opened all along the way. When I look through the lens I have now at the past few years, I'm struck by the vulnerability that I realize we all have. And I didn't, I didn't realize it so clearly until the last couple of years, but when I think about the vulnerability that we've all had to this pandemic um, that you know, we, didn't, we didn't see coming, I think about, um, and I know at the, um, the panel discussion last summer that there was a lot of talk about um, George, George Floyd's killing and the protests that, that led to that. And I think about the timing of everything and how many people of all races came out to say enough, enough. And I think, had there not been a pandemic, could that have happened? And, and maybe not, not that I'm saying I'm thankful for the pandemic, but it did facilitate people coming together that I don't know if they could have or would have had it not been for that. So. You know, I, I think about the vulnerability of our, um, our republic and our constitution. 
you know, what we saw last January. And I would never have thought that we were vulnerable in, in the way that was demonstrated then. So thinking about all of that, you know, looking forward, I want us to not take these things for granted, not take for granted that we've made such and such amount of progress in terms of um, equity and, and racial harmony and government and, and all of these things that, that um, you know, we thought, well, we're doing okay. We're really, we haven't been doing okay and we need to take it very seriously and start doing okay. And from my perspective as a mental health professional and as an educator, it's a lot about communication, about being willing to have conversations about difficult subjects and being willing to um, admit confusion or bewilderment and express vulnerability and humility and, you know, none of us are getting out of here alive. And I think it's our responsibility to our, ourselves, our communities, and, and to our creator to figure out the short time we're here, how do we do this well so that we leave whatever we encounter um, better off than how we found it? Thank you, Doc. Thank you all. All right, so uh, thank you for those opening comments. Now, we're going to move into uh, somewhat of a lightning round. All right, because I want to get to the audience and make sure you have the opportunity to ask your questions. And we're going to uh, stick to our timeline to make sure that uh, we're respectful of everybody's uh, calendar. Now, I'm going to ask this question and I'm going to point out a, a couple of experts to talk. And then um, based on that, if there are one or two others that I may point to, I'll ask you to chime in as well. So uh, how can we form um, a policy perspective that engages our legislators and the business community and others who are influential in our city um, to help families and children who experience trauma and harm. And Dr. Rice, I'm going to start with you and your response. You have 30 seconds <laughs> to give a response. And then secondly, um, Deputy Commissioner, I'm going to come to you on this same question, and I have another question for the rest of the panel. All right, Dr. Rice. Yeah, I think it's important for us to uh, know who our legislators are, uh, to cultivate relationships, and not just base it off of uh, a lack of, but look at ways to collaborate and partner and to convey our needs. Uh, I know that for uh, Coppin, we've had Senator Antonio Hayes, who's been an ally, and I think that through the HBCU lawsuit, we also saw how student advocacy, faculty advocacy, and support of other groups uh, can affect positive change. I think that was a great response, and I'll build on that, build on that a little bit. Um, so I can tell you that um, in, in the work of policy, when you're thinking about it, it it's, it's almost like asking a have to give up something. People don't want to give up if they think it's going to cause them loss. So that's one of those places that as a united front, the more voices that are heard on an issue, people take that issue more seriously. And I think especially where it concerns um, the uh, HBCU campus, I think we could show up more, show up stronger, show up more unified to hold accountable legislators and business communities to commit because the reality is business communities are getting something on the backs of community, their wealth. And so the only, sometimes the only uh, uh, means to hear so, cause someone to hear you is the disruption of that. Uh, and I'm saying that in a way of, of commerce. Mm -hmm. Like be wise about how and where we spend our dollars and have those dollars reflective of the issues that, that we have as a community and that they're showing up to champion those things. And that's in part through your legislative representation. Thank you. Second question. You all have talked about um, domestic violence and all of these things that have uh, impacted many of you on our panel. Now, I want you to address um, some valid reasons for the apathy and homelessness, I'm sorry, hopelessness, that many of our community members feel. And then identify 
some ways you believe that we can move the needle forward. And I'm going to go to uh, Mr. D. Watkins, and I'm going to follow him up with uh, Mr. Chapman. Thank you. One thing I will say is that young people need something to believe in. Um, over, the past, over the past five years, I've been fortunate enough to um, partner with One Book Baltimore, Penn Faulkner, and my own money, and we donated over 30,000 copies of my books to Baltimore City Public School students. On top of those donations, we made visits, and a lot of times I was the first author that they ever met. That gave them something to look forward to five years later of getting, I still get emails, or I still get social media messages on people who want to be authors or who want to be writers now because I came to that classroom, I talked to them, I donated books, um, we gave away gift cards, we did things to give them something to look forward to, and now the ones who were serious, I am able to help guide their careers as they enter the world of literature. So I think a lot of times, um, like we all know the problems. We all know the problems. We can identify the problems 10,000 times. Everybody in this room can, but what are the solutions? Uh, Bob, is always exposure and accessibility. I'm not just a guy who you'll see on the television or you know sitting up on some type of perch. I might be in your block, in your school, or in your neighborhood, and when you hit me, I hit back. Thank you. Um, to agree with him, get involved. Um, a lot of people my age are not involved. They're not. Um, like he said, we know the problems. Everybody can speak a problem, can talk about the problem, but who wants to be the solution? Um, that's 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 where it is right there. Who wants to be the solution? Um, we need more involvement. We need unity. Um, teamwork make the dream work. Like he said, a lot of people. He he went to classes and they were the first off. They, they were the first. He was the first off they they met. Um, it wasn't nobody involved and nobody to to show me. Just the other day, I read my first book, um, Kondawani Fidel. My, my professor, shout out to him. But that's, that's, that's what it is. Nobody's involved. It's nobody to look up to. Um, a lot of people don't know, can I do it? Can I be this? It's examples out there, bad examples of I can be that. So that's, it's, that's what we need. We need involvement and unity, that's all. Let me ask this question because we, we, we talk about the violence, we talk about the hopelessness, uh, we talk about our young people. Uh, we often find ourselves in a generational discussion uh, that the younger generation has their perspective, the older generation has its perspective, and so forth. Talk to us a little bit about how do we come together and engage individuals. Um, in, a, in a way that moves us beyond those sticking points. Um, and Mr. Chapman, I'm gonna come back to you again on this one, and I'm gonna also bring in um, uh, Dr. Uh, Bray Stennis. The way we could do that is actually step foot. Um, you can use social media, but that's just on a camera. Actually showing face and actually being there, um, the first place you want to start with is the youth. Um, the youth, that's that's one thing that I feel as though where where we should start is going to elementary schools, going to middle schools, and just put in the work, like actually put in the work. Show them you can be this. Um, also, shed light on on different opportunities. Um, yeah, that's shed light on different opportunities. The, the opportunities, everyone wants to be this or that, but nobody doesn't know about the the hard workers. Everybody know the glitz and the glamour, and everybody shoot for that, but don't they don't know about me personally. I would have never thought about being a police officer. I would have never thought that, but every, it's the bad image put onto the, the, the police department, but not the good image. Um, and that, that's just what it is. You just need to, to, to show that you can do these things. Mm -hmm. okay. 
So thank you for that, for that question. There was, um, I was trying to think of who, who made the statement, but people don't, don't care who you are until they know that you care, right? And I think so many times we really harp on and give more light to the differences than to the similarities. The similarities are what connect us. The similarities, coming together around similarities is how we can show that we care, right? So I think one of the things that we can do, Mr. President, is create safe spaces where we can show that we care. I think it is a powerful statement that we just reopened our um, child care center. That shows that we care, right? We understood that there was a similar need and we are trying to meet the need by showing that we care. We create safe spaces, but that's not enough. To create the space and nobody comes, well, what does that do, right? So we create the space, but then we invite people into the space. And Mr. Coppin said that we literally have to be there to invite people. We have to be present to invite people. So we create the space, we invite them in, and then we have dialogue about our similarities before we tell them how wrong and slow and messed up and dressed wrong and all of that. They don't want to hear that. They will not hear it until they know that you care. But once they know that you care, you've demonstrated it, then you can share messages, you can empower, you can mentor in a different way. But first, we have to show that we care. That's where it starts to me. So I'm going to build off that because, uh, Mr. Coppin, you touched on something that was in my next question. Uh, and then, Doc, you just uh, also brushed up against it. Now, this question here I'm going to ask to, um, I'm going to bring in uh, Professor uh, Fecho and uh, Deputy Commissioner and D. Watkins. I want you to chime in on this one, too. Uh, again, be mindful about 30 seconds because I want to get all of you all in on this particular point here. Within our community, uh, how do we not only work through these generational conversations and differences, but how do we build a community of better transparency and trust with the end goal of uh, ridding our community of this snitch or anti-snitch mentality? Okay. So how do we how do we engage in dialogue where we build partnerships and relationships and strengthen communication and transparency, all with the goal of if we're going to help solve some of the crime and the things that we see in our community, because very rarely does it go unseen, mm -hmm. right? Somebody saw, somebody knows, somebody heard, somebody talked to. How do we get rid of that anti-snitch mentality that is almost seen as a badge of honor. And Mr. Watkins, I see you thinking so deeply. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go with you first, all right? And then I'm gonna come to you, uh, Deputy Commissioner, and then Dr. Fetcher, I'll come with you to bring up the rear. 30 seconds, right? 30, that's all I give it. I'm, 30. <laughs> unpopular opinion, but I've been in the street my whole life. People tell all of the time. Like, I think that the whole idea of anti-snitch is good in media. I think it's good. Um, I think people like to talk about it in music. I think a whole lot of people go into the system and they come back home without showing their paperwork. And to that, what I will say is if we want to get to the if we want to solve that problem or if we want to kill that stigma or if we want to have real conversation about it, a real conversation about it, the goal is how do we get community members and police officers to talk, to share ideas, to feel like we're on the same page or to feel like um, we're both here to protect and, and, and serve and show love to each other. So the bigger conversation for me is all about building the relationship between people in the community and police officers, and when we do that, I don't even think um, that conversation will be in, in existence, even though I, I stand on what I said. People tell all of the time. <laughs> <laughs> they just don't want to get caught telling, right? They don't That's want right. to get caught telling. That's they right. They definitely be making them statements. <laughs> <laughs> they, look, at the, look at social media. They tell on themselves on the internet. They get on the YouTube and they be like, oh, here's my gun, here's my drugs. I'm, I'll be at five o'clock, I'm making this appointment right here. I'm like, wow, this is, this technology is crazy. <laughs> 
and 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 he's making a point, Doctor Watson. You're making a point. It's it's, it's factual. Um, just to kind of ground a little bit, we're with inside the confounds of the Western District. Mm -hmm. The nine districts, Western yes. District, is is number seven of nine. There are 42 homicides this year just inside of 2.8 square miles, and only four of those are closed. So when you start talking about um, how do you tear down the lines of what's happening, this snitching culture, um, we are all impacted, affected by, traumatized by, struggling with violence. It shows up in many different types of ways, but we have to find a way to come to the table. That's built in trust. It's hard to trust who you don't know. We have a responsibility to get out and know our communities. And, and in that, do better than we've done before. Demonstrate better. There are many ways that we're, we're trying to do that now. Our transparency page, um, co-producing and teaching um, community policing plans. Community members are actually teaching that at the academy. Most people, a lot of people don't know that. Um, the consent decree. But beyond those, those things that we're doing structurally, it's having a relationship. Showing up, show that you care, and you're physically showing up, and you're availing yourself to the problem and the need, and you're helping to address it. A crime is an imbalance of health and community. Mm -hmm. It's a byproduct. Mm -hmm. It is not the root. That's right. It's a byproduct. We have to get to the root of causation, and to do that, we have to have trust and communication. Thank you. Dr. Vecho. Thank you. I, I feel like um, it, it brings to mind an adage that we have in the family counseling field, which is kids who feel right act right. And I think that's true for adolescents and adults as well. And w when we're looking at people who aren't acting right, we want to ask, well, they're not feeling right. Why are they not feeling right? And I think a lack of, um, of belonging, of relationship, um, like Deputy Commissioner uh, Briscoe spoke to, we know that you know, the black community is a relational community. Relationship is everything. And so I, I think a tremendous emphasis on cult being culturally responsive to the community is important. I think um, you know, we've mentioned how there's a lack of trust in some of the systems. So I think we go to the systems where there is some trust. And maybe that's the faith communities, maybe it's um, local local merchants or maybe it's the community schools and we start you know we start putting programs and putting police officers and and um, outreach by you know by cop in by um, places that are trusted mm -hmm. and start to build relationship there and I think that will help improve transparency and and confidence in speaking out okay thank you All right. All right, let me go to one more question here um, that I think is very important, and uh, our deputy commissioner touched on this briefly earlier. Um, but from your perspectives, uh, based on your opinion, how can HBCUs, uh, such as COP and State, uh, make a bigger impact on uh, Baltimore City and beyond? And so, Dr. Rice, I'm going to start with you, uh, and that, I'm going to let everybody answer this question. All right, again, I'm going to give you 30 seconds to answer this question. But how, what can HBCUs do, right? I, I mean, clearly, no one entity can do everything. But HBCUs can do something. Uh, many are doing some things, um, but we could likely do more. But let me hear from you as a panel of experts, uh, what is it that you believe HBCUs can do to help lift our city uh, as we move forward? I think one of the things that we can do is uh, be in a unique, unique position uh, to conduct research that's meaningful, uh, that's important to the community, uh, that can lead to solutions. I say that because uh, we have a gun violence project uh, funded through the Thurgood Marshall College Fund, uh, and it's Coppin State, several other leading HBCUs uh, in the country, and our goal is to interview 150 black males in each of our respective cities to learn more about factors that influence their possession of guns. Uh, and so this is relational work. Uh, it's a student team that's been developed, uh, and we've gone through training. Uh, and our goal is to be able to get information along with the other HBCUs uh, that can be empowering. One, we're going into the communities non-judgmental and giving a voice to many who may be viewed as voiceless, 
Uh, but we're also taking that information, hopefully, uh, to use it to inform uh, crime prevention and to inform uh, the greater public health. So this isn't drive-by research for the aim of publications, but this is intentional, meaningful uh, research and engagement with the community to try to identify solutions to a critical problem. Thank you, Doug. Research is important and necessary. It helps inform the work we do and where we are and why. But after the research, it is the, ma the, matter, the practical matter of being on the ground. I think being a bridge. Um, I, I can tell you from the seat of policing, we have very few bridges. And oftentimes, especially in the black community, the word comes up, the faith community. Mm -hmm. The faith community is fractured, many of which don't live in the communities that we serve. They're, like, they just, they're, they're, they're not they there, it, right? they're not present. Yep. So I think that because you are present, especially um, Coppin, like you're here in the heart and the crooks of like where things are not necessarily going well or right, but be a better bridge and to help facilitate communities' needs with the structures in which they have to operate because many don't know in points of access. They don't know how to access the things that exist. Lots of programs and strategies are on the ground that oftentimes there's a lack of access, whether that is the digital divide, whether that's healthcare, um, public safety, like there is a gap between um, the, the end user and those that provide the service, so a bridge to access. Thank you. A thing that HBCUs can do is shed the light on HBCU culture um, and also start at home. Cotton State University is right on North Avenue, um, 15 minutes up the street. It's East Baltimore, and then we're in West Baltimore. Um, Morgan, Morgan is 20 minutes away. Come together, shed the light on the HBCU culture. College is most of the time is the PWI aspect. People don't know that you can go to a HBCU and be next to people that you literally that you literally can relate to. Some people come from broken homes. Some people literally came here because they got kicked out their house. But people don't HBCUs don't shed the light enough on the HBCU culture, Greek life, clubs and orgs. That's that's interesting. When if you shed the light on the cult, if we shed the light on the HBCU culture. It is more interesting. It's more. It's more intriguing. People can actually see, and we, we're in the dark. We we hiding. You gotta the community. They go seek. Majority of the HBCU students, they go seek the college. The college don't go seek them. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, two things that come to mind. Um, one, growing up in East Baltimore, you know. I'm, I'm old now, so I know Coppin has a, a glorious history. Um, so many amazing and talented people went to this school. And growing up, I never knew the story of Coppin. Why don't I know that story? How come it doesn't exist? How come, you know, alumni and, and the accomplishments that they, you know, that they made isn't something that's talked about in our classrooms? Now, I told y'all here, I've been to all of these Baltimore City Public School classrooms. I've talked to so many students. I've been to so many different schools. And I truly believe there should be a copping room um, set up in some of our high schools. It can almost be like a farm system to hand deliver students from Baltimore City Public Schools to that college experience. And in this room, we can celebrate the glorious story that exists within these walls. But young people, uh, older people, a lot of people just don't know, but they deserve to know. And as a, as a collective, um, you know, uh, we should be talking about, I'm saying we like, a, like, a, like, like I'm, I got an office here. As a collective, I would like to see people <laughs> in power talk about what people like myself who are in and around these communities can do to actually elevate and highlight and promote that beautiful black Baltimore story because it needs to be told. We should be taking pride in our schools. We should be taking pride in what's happening right now. We should be taking pride in all of this stuff. But so many people are walking around and they just don't know it. That is a, that's a crime to me. Thank you. Okay. So I would say that um, get in where you fit in. And when you don't fit in, Shirley Chisholm said, when, they, when you go into a place and they don't have a chair, you bring your own. So there are some places we may not fit in, but we need to bring our own chair so we can just have a seat at the table. We have to be present. We must be present where decisions are being made. 
We may not always be invited. Bring your chair. The second thing that I think we have to do as HBCUs is celebrate those who are doing the work. And there are lots of people in this room, I dare not start calling names because I will get myself in trouble, but there are people in this room today who are doing the work on behalf of and alongside HBCUs. And I think once we start celebrating them, other people will want to connect and collaborate, partnerships will build, and the work collectively will get done. So those are two things that I think we could do. Thank you, Doc. I would like to, um, to echo what Mr. Chapman and Mr. Watkins said. I think we need, there was some talk a couple years ago, like do we really need HBCUs anymore? And absolutely we do, I think more than ever. And I think it, here at Coppin, I'd like to see a greater emphasis on us as an HBCU and what that means. I'd like to see every faculty, staff, and student n know what that means, what it, what it means to be an HBCU. Um, just before I left home, I, I copied and pasted a paragraph from the, di the dissertation I'm working on, which is about cross-racial um, education within HBCUs. And this is from, from the dissertation. HBCUs make up only 3% of four-year colleges in the U.S., yet they've produced 80% of the nation's black judges, 50 to 65% of black doctors, and 50% of black teachers. I won't go on spouting statistics at you, but we all need to know that and be very proud of it. And I'm not sure everybody does know that. Thank you, Doc. All right. So obviously, uh, as the president, you all have touched on some of the things we've been talking about. And uh, it's good to hear some of the other pieces of information that you and the jewels that you've dropped today. Um, and I, I saw the provost writing, so uh, she's, taking, she, she's taking everything into account that you all have said. But now uh, I want to turn to our audience uh, and give them the opportunity to ask any questions they may have. Now again, I'm going to get you, Doc. <laughs> Doc was ready. She was ready. I'm, I'm going to get you, Dr. Buckley. I'm going to get you. All right, so uh, let me set a couple of ground rules. We have a condensed amount of time. Ask a question. Uh, save all comments and praise for later during the picture sec uh, opportunity here. Just the questions. And for our panel, again, I'm keeping you 30 seconds response so we can uh, make sure we can get as many questions in from the audience as possible. And we're going to start with uh, Dr. Buckley. Let me go to a student first. All right. And here in the blue, California. Yes, because you and I met walking over and you told me you were coming. I'm glad to see you here. So please stand up, ask your question. We have a microphone for you here. Thank you, Kelly. Okay. Oh. Okay. Um, as a student. And for, I I'm sorry, always introduce yourself mm -hmm. so we know to whom we're talking with. Okay, my name is Kaylin Towns. I'm a criminal justice major. I'm a sophomore. Um, as a first-generation student at Coppin State, I just want to know some things that, um, that can be done on our campus that can make us feel more, you know, proud that we made such a huge achievement of first, like, getting into this campus, well, this college, actually. So that's my question. Well, I'm going to let Mr. Chapman jump on that one. And I was going to jump on it, too, but you, you go ahead from the student's perspective as Mr. Coppin. What, what would you share with your fellow Eagle? I would share with you is I'm also a first generation college student. So my advice to you is find other first generation college students. Let's start something for first generation college students and shed the light on the first generation college students. Because I, I will say that is a minimized thing. Um, and congratulations to you also, uh, especially coming from Baltimore City. Being a first generation college student, you probably dealing with home still and dealing with here. You know, so um, I would say the, the get involved and put yourself, put yourself in and step out, step out your comfort zone. Um, step out your comfort zone and get other people involved so we can shed light, so we can appreciate the fact that we are first generation college students and we can help the ones outside. 
So let me also add just very quickly, because I want to get to some other questions. We are looking at how we celebrate all of our students. Here at Coppin team, we are focusing on how we do more in the world of traditions at this institution, how we revamp our first year experience program so that we introduce you to, to the rich history that, uh, uh, that Dee Watkins talked about, uh, and that also you understand that you are the reason that we're here. We are looking at everything we do to become more student-centered because that is important. Because not only have you beat numerous odds to get here, right, that's not enough. I want to make sure that you have such an environment that it gets you to the end of your journey here and on that stage in that cap and gown so you can continue to go on and do great things. But while you're here, I want your experience to be so charged that you leave here talking about the glorious days at Coppin State University. That's what we're going to do. That's not what we are planning. Team, that is what we are going to accomplish at this university. Under my administration and with all of these experts and those in the audience helping, we're going to transform lives and we're going to make sure your experience is second to none. All right. And I'm going to be tapping you students to help us do that because the president, the faculty, the staff cannot do it alone. This is about your journey and we want you to be a part of the discussion of, of mapping out that journey and what it looks like. All right. All right. Let me come right here, and then I'm going to come to you, Dr. Buckley. Hello, my name is Cameron Durant. I'm a criminal justice major. Um, I'm a junior. I'm also an, a resident assistant and junior class vice oh, president, not vice president, I'm sorry. Um, my question is for Mr. Watkins. You mentioned about having a popping room in every high school, and I think that is a great idea, and I just wanted to know like, how you would go about that. So I can't speak for Coppin because I don't represent Coppin. But what I will say is that um, I've built relationships with teachers all over Baltimore City because uh, like a lot of students are reading like, the books that I've written. And I talk to teachers and I talk to administrators about this all of the time. Like we need to be doing something to get kids excited, especially like a lot of, you know, I'm for transparency. I, I, I've been offered opportunities to leave Baltimore City so many times that I'm just like, I'm a local yokel. I'm stuck. I don't think a war could get me out of this city, right? <laughs> it's very difficult to get me out of here. And a lot of my peers or a lot of young people are just like me. They just don't want to leave. So if they're going to go to school, then they're going to choose schools in, in Baltimore. So we should be, you know, doing things to get them excited about the choices that they have here. And everybody loves the idea, but you know, every time I've had this conversation, it, 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 I'm greeted with all of this excitement, and then it, and then it kind of goes away. But I would, I would love to see it. So thank you for that great question, and thank you for your comments. And uh, while he said he can't speak for COP, and I can. Mm -hmm. All right. And uh, it seems like that um, uh, D. Watkins has been bugging my cabinet meetings because we've been talking about that, and that is a uh, that is a top priority because again. People want to socialize themselves with something that they see, mm -hmm. right? Something that is well known and respected. And if you are well known and respected and you are multiple places, that helps build the brand of your institution or whatever you are simply working on. And so we have talked about that. Um, our provost uh, uh, has been charged with making sure that we connect with uh, not only uh, K through 12 schools, but also our community college partners to have Coppin spaces in those facilities. I just was on a tour, was it la late last week, with the two libraries um, that um, uh, uh, book in um, North Avenue. I was in there talking about how we're going to partner with them and how we're going to bring Coppin into those, those, uh, those public community libraries. It's important. It's important for folks to see us, especially in this community. This is our community. This is, this is our house, right? And so as the mayor and others and I have talked, when I turn and drive down North Avenue, I want to see Coppin banners on every light post. I want to drive past stores and see signage that say we support Coppin because I'm tired of the lip service. See, that's been going on a long time, right? 
And everybody talks about how important copping is, but I don't see enough action. So we're going to make sure we do our part so our community understands that they are a part of us and we are a part of them. We need to hug each other tighter and make sure that we're representing each other's best interests. Okay? So you will be seeing that. And uh, D. Watkins, thank you for uh, your points on the, um, on the copping room in the schools because that is spot on. All right, Dr. Buckley, you had a question. Yes, because you, had, you were eagerly sitting there waiting for your question. Waiting patiently. I really appreciate this dialogue. Um, there's something that you said, Dee Watkins, about the thing that separates wealthy people from poor people is Connection. connections. Um, and so my question slash comment is from a, from a social justice perspective, how can we create more opportunities around these kinds of connections? Because here's the thing. Um, I think that a lot of times in urban cities like Baltimore, we have a tendency to overlook the work that is being done by the people, oftentimes with little to no resources. They do not have access, thus they don't have the connections, right? Um, uh, to, to Mr. Chapman's point about young people, um, I think that we do have a lot of young people in our city doing amazing things. There are a lot of youth-led organizations where young folks are just incredible. We have young people here at Coppin, such as yourself. Um, we have authors here at Coppin. Matter of fact, one of my former students just wrote a book, um, Dason Brooks, it's called The Talk, and it's on Amazon if y'all wanna get it, The Talk. <laughs> anyway, so I think that we have a unique combination here in our city of people who are frustrated, of course, um, lack of resources, we know that. Um, people who are quite competent and want to do the work, but they need the connections. So how do we create more opportunities around that? And then I also want to touch on, I, I think Dr. Wright, somebody was talking about community presence. And I feel like I've seen you at, even though I have kids, um, Deputy Commissioner, do you, have, do you attend the PTA meetings at this elementary school not too far from here? I do not regularly attend them, but I'm, I'm likely to be found anywhere. I feel like I've seen you there before. So, and, 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 and that strikes me because community and, and con there are connections that happen in the community. So, you know, th that's one part of the connections, but I'm interested in hearing what you have to say about making those connections. So something that I've, I've written about a lot in my career is this whole idea of skill sharing, figuring out what you're passionate about, working really, really hard to achieve success, and then sharing that skill with other people. So my thing is writing. I do it in writing. I have a friend named Tony who does it in fitness. Um, other people who do it across the board. Who, what are you doing? And as your body of work, and I'm, now I'm, ta I'm dipping into my artist brain, what is your body of work, right? What are you putting out? Just one of your bodies of work, and then your other body of work is who are you putting in a position to be able to do the same? Uh, I got a phone call from one of my, one of my mentees today on the way here who is about to uh, revamp the marketing campaign for the Oreos because I was, and I'm not taking any, I'm not taking all of the credit for his hard work because he works, he works extremely hard, but um, he's a cotton professor now, but um, because he was able to go with me to New York and I can introduce him to agents, or I can get on the phone and say, look, he deserves a book deal, give him one, or I can take him to events and show him how to maneuver in some of these different spaces, and now he has these skills, and he's taking these skills, and he's sharing them with other people. So it's like, once you have success, one of the goals should be, should be to make sure you are constantly lifting as you climb, putting other people and opportunities to be able to be successful as well. Um, I try my best to not speak on as far as like what other people do. I, I try to stay in a positive space because it's so easy to be negative. It's so easy for me to draw from negative experiences in my own career when I was still trying to figure it out and how to get started in the industry. But instead of, of talking bad about the help that I didn't have, I take all of that energy and I pour it into young men and women who want to be writers and who want to work in television too. So. In order, we have to be the people we didn't need. I'm inspired by listening to this young brother speak because I can see him walking into a classroom 
talking about being Mr. Coppin, talking about his dreams, talking about his goals, and then sparking the mind of the next person who's going to come up and and partner with him, and they'll get together and take everything to the next level. So it's like, are we just talking about change, or are we actually putting our money where our mouth at? Are we saying we love you and support you and your Black Life Matter, or are we pulling up to your events? Are we pulling up to your neighborhood? Are we sharing our contacts? Are we reading your work and really reading your work and telling you it's terrible when it's terrible and telling you that it's amazing when it's amazing? Are we showing that kind of love? And as one person, I work extremely hard at this, and I challenge everybody who I have the opportunity to, to work with or, or edit or critique or give advice to, to once you make a couple of dollars, once you do something, once you figure out your lane, bring somebody with you because that's the only way we're going to build a foundation and really, really have like the reality that we have. I'm working on an HBO show in Baltimore right now, and now like over a thousand Baltimore residents involved. And it's not all, it's not because of me, but it's because of so many people who care about seeing Baltimore people get exposure to TV, understand how to run a set, understand you can PA, you can grip, you can uh, do hair, you can do makeup, you can do all of these different things. And it's beautiful to see some of the, some of the artists and who, who, who work in, in some of these different departments um, OG and, and, and give game and show love to younger artists coming in. Like two of them got nominated for Emmys because they worked on Lovecraft and they back in Baltimore working on We Own the City. So it's like, it's some of us who are doing it, but part of it is to do it. The other part is to challenge your circle of change makers, of professors, of administrators, of people who are doing great. Challenge them to, 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 so who you pulling up? Because that's part of your body of work too. Who you putting on? Who's, who's up next? Who's the next person? And make that a normal conversation because we kind of don't have that enough. Man and mentor is not just about um, telling somebody they're great. It's about, you know, answering the phone when they're crying, answering the phone when they broke, and then celebrating them when they do something good. And it's, you know, it's what they say, um, success is normally disguised as hard work, but, that, but we have to do it or we won't have anything. Thank you. Thank you. So obviously, um, great discussions and many, many more questions than we have answers. Um, and this is not a one and done. Uh, I said when I arrived, we would uh, have these ongoing discussions with community members, experts, uh, the experts within our own institution, uh, as we continue to try and build inroads and create solutions to many of the challenges that we have and that uh, so many uh, members of our community face. Uh, you know, Mr. Um, uh, uh, D. Watkins uh, and, and everything that he said, uh, which I think is spot on, uh, Dr. Buckley, takes me back to what I always tell my incoming freshmen when I have the chance to talk to them. And I ask them, uh, you know, you, you've heard that old saying that it's all about who you know, right? And then I tell them, stop believing that because that's not true. It's not about who you know. It's about who knows you. Because you can know all the people in the world, but if they're not willing to vouch for you, to connect you, when that opportunity comes about, if you're not the first person that comes to their mind, then you don't know anybody, right? And so that's where we have to make sure that the, the partnerships that we have are authentic and mutually beneficial, and that we are doing it from a place of authenticity in all of our body of work, right? Whether we're trying to build relationships, whether we are trying to partner, work, solve issues, challenges, if we're coming from it of a place of selfishness, we're never going to be successful. Now, you might have the short-term success, but trust me, you will be exposed every time 100%. I want to thank you all for coming out. I want to thank you for your engagement. I'm going to turn it over very quickly to Dr. Rice for his closing comments. And I'm not going to give him 30 seconds. I'm going to ask him to do it in 20 seconds. I'm going to take 10 because I use about nine of those. And then we're going to uh, let everyone go. And I encourage you all uh, to come up, meet our guests uh, more intimately, but understand that they do have to get to other events. Uh, but I do want you to have the opportunity to at least uh, get to shake their hand and talk to them as well. Dr. Rice. Can we uh, clap it up for our panel and our first our panel? And can we uh, clap it up for President Jenkins? 
So I just, I'm going to be brief, uh, 20 seconds. Uh, I wanted to again uh, acknowledge our student scholars that are here, uh, faculty, staff, as well as our guests uh, virtually. Uh, you know, I want to acknowledge the uh, planning committee, key people such as Ms. Galliano, Ms. Brooks, uh, Ms. Thomas, uh, Ms. Robertson helped me this morning to make sure that we got information to you uh, and had uh, our day starting off in the right way. So what's the charge? Do not let current challenges dim your light. Look at crises and problems that emanate as opportunities for solutions. If you look at and think about the title, the title speaks to Baltimore and beyond because while we, many of us, similar to D. Watkins, just have a, a love for this city, we also realize that some of our eagles will soar beyond Baltimore and go to different parts of the United States and go to different countries and make a difference. If you got anything out of today, I hope that you considered the assets, the things that we bring to the table as an institution, as scholars, as community leaders, and continue to leverage that in a positive way to affect change. I want to thank you for your commitment, for your dedication, and for our student scholars, for your inspiration to us to do what we do. I want to thank everyone and bring this event to a formal close. Stay tuned for more. Thank you.